Hi, I'm Simon Kidd, and today we come brown trout fishing in the heart of Devon, right up on the high moors here of Dartmoor. We're stood on the banks of the, of the East Dart here. We've got the West Dart a bit further over to our, to our west indeed, and we're gonna go and have a look at the river a bit further down later on. But for the time being, I'm joined by my good friend, David Grove. And um, Dave, I think you've got some ideas for us today. Yeah, Simon, these are actually perfect conditions for fishing the East Dart. The water, color and temperature and air conditions are absolutely perfect. It's an ideal opportunity for going onto the higher moor. It's very rare that you get these conditions, so when we get up there, the fish are hardly fished for. With all these conditions behind us, we should have a great day. As you say, the conditions today are quite exceptional. It's very warm, everything's lush and green. We've had quite a bit of rain just lately. Some of the places we can see here where the water's actually rushed down on the spate, the water's dropped back down very quickly. I think we're in for a superb day. So what are we going to be using today, then, Dave? Well, I reckon, I'm just looking here now, there's, already there's some stonefly hatching. Um, and also up on the higher moor, uh, with the right conditions, the dark olives will start coming up. If that happens, the fish absolutely go wild on them. So let's keep our fingers crossed, and if it happens, bingo. Lovely. So we're looking at, at dry fly fishing today, Dave, primarily. These conditions will bring out the dry flies. We'll bring the flies into a, a, a hatching um, frenzy, and um, if that happens, like I said just now, if it happens, then we're in real, real luck because higher up on the wall there, we don't get these conditions very often. Fantastic, I'm excited already. Let's get fishing. I've, got, I've brought two rods with me. Uh, one's a 10 foot three weight, the other's a nine and a half foot for, for dries only. Uh, the 10 foot three weight I've made up with a long leader it's, um, I've got a double taper line, uh, it's called a nymph line, but I use this for fishing in the river, fishing upstream particularly. We've got a gentle upstream breeze now, which is a benefit too. Um, especially on water like this, we've got a nice long pool. And what we don't want to do is, is spook the fish that are in the pool, especially the fish nearer to us that will run up through and spook everything else by putting the fly line on the water. With this method, long leader, um, up to 20 foot long actually the leader before the fly's on the end. and. Um, uh, this light fly line, it should it be on the water, but it's probably not even going to be on the water with a long rod and everything. High sticking. And uh, a method we call one style after a really good friend of mine, Juan Del Carmen, who showed me how to use it and everything. It was extremely successful um, in places like Spain and that sort of thing. The um, Spanish, of course, have been fantastic at dry fly and, and fishing in, in clear waters especially. And uh, works really well up here. Dave, on the other hand, um, Dave's using a shorter rod, uh, a much faster rod than this one probably, and something he's had uh, specifically made for. For the dart up here, he used to live up here for years, he might speak with a with a Londoner's accent, but he's been in Devon most of his life now and, and knows the, these moors like the back of his hand and this river and everything. So, um, Dave, what is, it, what is it you're putting up? What I'm putting up, Simon, is a traditional uh, double taper, three weight line, and I'm gonna be, like you, increasing the length of the leader because of the conditions, but uh, I'll probably be going to 12 feet rather than 20 feet. I like to normally use about an eight foot, nine foot leader up here, but I will increase it because of these conditions. Um, we don't have to worry too much about the water. It's still got a bit of color after the spate. Yeah. And I'm, I'm seeing a few fish rise ahead of us there where I think you'll score up there with your method. Uh, where I think I'm gonna score is uh, creeping up behind them, getting quite close to them in the riffley, in the pots. In the pots. Yeah. We've, uh, we've just seen a few flies coming up here as well. There's a couple of stonefly I think we've seen already. And, um, yeah, there's definitely fly life starting to move up here, although there's not a lot of action at the moment, but as I think it warms up, then hopefully we'll see a bit more. Because I've seen a few stone fly hatching, I'm going to be putting on a, um, not a CDC flat wing fly. I've gone to Possum. Uh, I learnt this, I learnt this in the Commonwealth Championships in Tasmania, and uh, the guys out there were using Possum fur instead of CDC, and it was just unbelievable. It transformed my dry fly fishing possum fur, I recommend it to anybody. You can gink it, you can dry it, you can do anything with it. It doesn't distort and it lasts forever. Whereas CDC, everybody knows that when it gets wet, you've got to dry it, you've got to frog fan it, you've got to do whatever you can to keep it in pristine condition to float. But with possum fur, you can do anything with it and it just keeps floating, it just keeps lasting forever, it's brilliant. So I'll be using a, a, a possum fur flat wing stone fly imitation. Probably, I don't know, about a size 16. I haven't seen any big stone flies come off at the moment, just small ones. So that's how I'm going to start. 
yeah, for my point fly, I've put on um, uh, a light olive pattern, which is uh, like an emergent olive, but also will double up as a stonefly pattern too, because there's a few little small yellow stonefly patterns coming here. Uh, and for the for the top dropper, I've got the two flies on about spaced about 18 inches, two feet apart. Uh, I've got a small small dry sedge on there, so um, there's always plenty of sedge up here, and the fish love the dry fly up here particularly. But so, um, we'll see how we go on with them. I've actually risen three fish to this uh, uh, stone fly that I'm using. They're coming up and taking it, but by the time I lift into it, they've, uh, they've already let go. They're, they're taking it, but they're not actually eating it, if you know what I mean. Uh, but this is ideal conditions for this kind of pool. Yeah. We've, got a, we've got a slight easterly wind putting a ripple on an otherwise flat surface. Yeah. And um, when it's like this, you can actually get some very nice fish out of these long, deep pools up on the higher water. Yeah. Uh, it, it dances nicely in the little ripple. Um, I'll get one in a minute, be sure of that. And I've, I've just had exactly the same experience a little bit further up here. And uh, fishing a long leader, fishing quite a long way off from the fish, um, you've, we've got to be really quick because a couple of them have taken the fly quite positively. They're only small fish, mind, but um, yeah, similar experience. So I, I have found as well when I got a bit closer to them, and um, they're literally coming up and hanging themselves. And that's. Um, that's the other secret. Dave was saying earlier on about fishing up in the pots and everything. Get really close. We're here. We can only fish at range on this water here, and that's uh, one of the one of the uh, pitfalls, if you like, of doing that with these smaller fish. I've just got into the river here. There's a couple of pools up in front of me here, which is nice. There's a very gentle breeze behind us, but I've got to keep down, keep out of sight, and everything, because these fish are very spooky. But getting close to them is going to be a help. Fishing the bigger, flatter pool just now. Um, at longer range, the fish will take him very quickly. They're only small fish at the moment, so um, if we get a decent fish, it'll hook itself much better. But on the smaller fish, I want to be fishing them a lot shorter. And as they take and turn with the fly, um, they're going to hang themselves on the rod, keeping the, high, the rod up nice, high sticking properly. Right, what Simon's doing, he's been very stealthy. Although he's got cover around him all over the place and up at the head of the pool, the fish are spooky today, uh, probably due to the bright sun. So you've got to be extra stealthy. And if you watch Simon, he's almost on his hands and knees in the river, creeping up behind the fish. With luck, he'll get one. Perfect, there he is. He sneaked in right underneath there. You wouldn't even know there was a gap underneath there, but he's gone right in underneath the bank. They don't spend much of their time. Um, Dave, you were just saying there's probably another fish, a better fish even, a little bit further up again, where the two little bits of water meet, because the fish are all in the pecking order in the pool. What I find on these smaller streams, because uh, the, in the low water like this, um, the actual area of feeding is limited, you'll find that the bigger fish are always stationed in the best places where the most food is likely to come. And then slowly, Behind that fish, you'll have the next size, the next size, the next size, until where you're standing, you've probably got just the par sitting. So the pecking order is very important on these little rivers. And you'll find, I bet you, if you don't get it, there will be one bigger than that, around about 20 feet higher than that, where the two runs from underneath this willow bush join, and there's a rock there, the bigger fish will be sat just there. 
Well, we'll have a little try for him. We have disturbed the pool, obviously, with our fish we just caught. Maybe it's one for later, but I'm going to have a click anyway. Okay, so we're on a path now just below Hart and Tor, which you can see just behind me. And we'll be following the river up for about half a mile from here. And when we get to Broad Down, which is the hill in the distance, we'll turn right onto about a mile stretch of river, which is lovely pot water. So let's see what we can do there. Yeah, so we're on our way uh, um, to our favorite places on the East Dart now, where we hope we're gonna get better sport. But Dartmoor is so full of history, en route, only if you knew what was around you. For instance, what I'm sitting on is an old burial chamber um, from the Bronze Age days. Um, and if you look carefully around the wall, you'll often come across these. Um, and over there on the side of Broaden Hill, there's a, a D-shape uh, wall of stones. And in that D-shape is um, a Bronze Age uh, hut circle settlement. And probably this burial chamber might even be one of those poor old souls that was buried here uh, at the end of his life. Dartmoor's not just about fishing, it's a beautiful place to come and everything, it's very um, very remote up here and so on and if you look around there's all sorts of other things, plenty of wildlife to see and uh, just around us here we've got um, some uh, bog cotton and that's the thing where it's wet but just here I've just found some uh, some sundew, there's two or three different varieties of them, different shaped leaves and so on. The, um, the soil up here is extremely acid, there's a lot of peat and everything so what the the plants need to do is get their uh, nutrition from somewhere else and these catch small insects on these sticky bodied leaves that you've got here and you find them in the bog. We've had a very very dry spring but there's still one or two of them here where there's, uh, we've got some water. Dave is absolutely right back there. We caught that nice fish and uh, just up above it was a more dominant fish in the pool. We missed that one but um, it was definitely there. We've come up a bit further now. I'm going to persevere with the dry fly or the double dry for the moment. I could fish a nymph under the dry as well with this setup, but I'm probably going to go. We've got much smaller, shorter pools here, but some of them are quite deep. And uh, I'm probably going to go to a single fly on the, on the shorter row at the moment. I'm going to persevere with this one for, uh, for a second and see how we get on in this pool here. I always wet my hands first, and um, it's very important you do this so that you don't uh, damage the protective slime on the fish, um, and also uh, it's less chance of knocking any scales off. Now that fish released itself, lucky enough, but as you saw, it was a nice little six, seven inch Dartmoor brownie. Uh, I actually cha changed tactics because this was a deeper run, and uh, I never had any, any rise to the fly. I thought there's got to be fish in there, so I actually changed to a little tiny pheasant tailed nymph with a black bead and it got the fly down just under subsurface uh, and sure enough there was a fish there as you saw. So when you're up here on these little Dartmoor streams, although it's great fun dry fly fishing, if the conditions um, are such where you think that the, the, there's a fish there and it's not rising, by all means try a little weighted pheasant tailed nymph or a little uh, olive nymph of some sort. Uh, and just drop it into the fast water at the heads of these pools, let it sink, and uh, if there's anything there that's not rising to dry fly, you'll probably have the nymph. Okay, did you see Simon get caught in the bush then? If you just gently pull your flies through the bush, don't pull it out quickly, just gently, gently pull it through the bush. The first fly came through and then slowly but surely the second fly, which I thought was going to catch, because he was pulling it so gently and steadily, it came through the bush smoothly and dropped into the water. Here we have a sedge pupae and um, this is its larval stage. Uh, and during the uh, late summer and autumn, this will hatch out, hatch out into a nice little uh, sedge and hopefully uh, the hungry trout will fill his belly on this one. And here we have an example of cased caddis. The one before was the uncased and in the cased caddis we have lovely little sedge pupae like that and they build the stones around them uh, and when the uh, floodwaters come along it disturbs these cases and all these little critters float down the river 
and the fish gorge themselves on them. And here we have a little stone creeper. If you notice their colour, they're black. If I can get him to wriggle for you. Anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a little very flat-bodied nymph which then hatches into the stone fly and uh, they, they creep along the stones and they hug them and again they, they're not disturbed until the spates come along. Yeah. And there's a, there's a Betis nymph next to him, it's just starting to wriggle, which is an olive nymph. And there's the two together. So that hatches into an upwing fly, a little olive. This one hatches into the uh, flat wing fly, uh, as a, known as a stone fly. Um, and that's what I started off with this morning. They're teaming with sedge, stone fly and olive. Uh, that's the main um, supply of food and uh, fly life. Um, there's the odd worm that creeps into the side of the bank, from the side of the bank, but not very much. Uh, but it's mainly those three flies and of course uh, in the autumn the daddy longlegs too. They, they come onto the river and they can uh, be quite a useful fly to use even in these small rivers. Wave hook. Just, uh, it's still barbless, completely barbless. It's got a little bit of shape to it, so it helps fish to stay on uh, when fishing this type of method. So, especially smaller fish like we're, we're after today. They're very agile and everything, and it helps them stay on without doing them any harm. That's a very, very dark fish. And I've just put um just changed to, I've still got the two flies on, but I've got a nymph underneath the dry, a little bit of a bead on it there. I had to get it some weight. And um, yeah, lovely leading edge uh, on that uh, thing there as well. Nature's so beautiful, Simon. They're lovely, yeah. Lovely beautiful markings. Beautiful wild fish. Perfectly thin and everything. And and there is a surprising amount of food up here for them. Yeah. Again, that know? fish was just up in the top, Dave, like you were saying before. Yeah. You get to the top of the pool, there is a pecking order in the pools. Yeah. And you've got a bit of fresh water there. There's plenty of oxygenated water. There's a bit of depth and there's a bit of cover coming from that tree. And that's exactly where it was. These fish have never been stocked. These fish are the result of the ice age. And it's a, and you know, the, the DNA of these fish hasn't changed since the days of the Ice Age. Isn't it just wonderful? That was interesting. That's a good fish in the tail of the pool. Looks a nice pool. What I try and do is hold the fish in the water when I release it and then there's hardly any damage done to it. Well do you know Nick, um, as you've just said, you know, I, I travel the world fishing, uh, whether it be uh, bone fishing at my school in the Bahamas or uh, big sea trout fishing in Argentina, Norway, uh, Iceland, all, all over the world, Canada. But do you know what? Coming back to the, the east and the west dark for me is so special. I think uh, coming back to your roots, where my fly fishing especially started, uh, I must never, and nor must anyone else forget 
what wonderful fishing we have up on these uh, little moorland streams all over the country. Uh, although they're much smaller, they're just as much fun and you need just as much skill. Yeah, that's a lovely little brownie from, from the high, high moor here. Um, as we come up through, this wasn't in very deep water, probably on about 18, 14 inches, 18 inches of water, something like that. And uh, the higher up we go, there seems to be the bigger fish we get and the better fish and everything. But um, yeah, lovely little brownie. Oh. Yeah, we've had a wonderful session here on the East Dart this morning this afternoon. Uh, it's still early afternoon, it's got really warm and lovely and sunny, the fish have risen freely to the dries and we've taken a few on the nymphs as well. But um, The river flows 24 miles from here down to the sea where it comes out at Dartmouth and we're now going to take a bit of adventure with Dave and go down and look at a little bit bigger part of the river a bit further down. We've come some distance down river now. Um, we've come below the confluence of the east and west start, about four or five miles. It's a lovely stretch of water, as you can see, it's considerably bigger than further upstream. I've still, for the moment, got the same leader on, but um, I'm probably a bit undergunned in terms of uh, length of leader here, could probably do with something quite a bit longer. Um, it's very flat water. There are fish on this near side here, where the bubbles lane is, there's one just risen there now. I'm gonna degrease here a little bit, just to try and help get the leader off the top, because there's no broken water or anything to do that. And uh, we'll see how we get on to start with, but I could probably do the longer leader, and I may go back to the, the two fly set up in a minute. Now it's only a small fish, but um, we just changed it to the nymph on, on the point. to the dart here, it's absolutely beautiful. We had great fun this morning uh, and early this afternoon up on the upper reaches across the dart moor, uh, on the east dart in particular. Uh, fish up there were taking dries, they weren't very keen to start with but um, they got more confident as the day went on and we had a couple on the nymphs as well up there because some of the deeper pools, the, the, uh, the larger fish in particular weren't coming up but we had a couple on nymphs at the same time and it's useful to try a combination of nymph and dries as well and that worked quite well for us. We pop down here, we've had a quick look around at the middle reaches of the dart here, it's absolutely beautiful, the weather's been fantastic, we've had a fabulous afternoon. But um, Dave, what would be your take on the day today? Yeah, I'd go along what you said uh, just now, Simon. Um, I think uh, if I were to round it up with what happened today uh, and give a few tips to anybody, then I think stealth was the, uh, the main one today. Definitely stealth, keeping well out of sight of the fish, using the cover that you had up there. Um, then I would uh, certainly increase the length of leader in, in conditions like this and probably go down um, a size or two in the point um, and then uh, be prepared to change um, from dry fly to nymph or dry fly and nymph according to the depth and size of the pools that we were fishing. Indeed Dave, we've tried a mixture of all of that today and uh, as I think you say, you know, we fish barbless as well which is interesting, we only fish yeah, barbless up yeah. here, it's all catch and release and I think it's an important thing that we mentioned that. You mentioned about the size of flies as well to me that during the day today, small dark flies and that sort of thing works very well up here. Yes. Um, we have had an excellent day, uh, Dave thank you so much for joining us today, your knowledge of the moors and the rivers up here and everything is fantastic. My pleasure. Well, we really appreciate that. Thank you very much. And all that's left for me to say is thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again soon.